posted up on the floor of my room Ears glued to the sounds coming out of my boom box And boy did that have me consumed Now I'm in the mirror trying to imitate every move Reading the album covers, visit my name in them credits One day, I'ma be just like them, bet it One day, I'm gonna fulfill my dreams And bet the world knows me when I grace the screen, yeah Fast forward like four or five years Now I'm the man on the mic in the midst of all of my peers Confidence turned to arrogance Cause it's so clear In a room full of artists I'm the dopest one there One of few battles experience some rap beat All from a worldly image that was never made for me In the kingdom I had to come and find my place And God asked would you rather be good or would great? Would you rather be good or 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 great? It was all a dream, sort of like notorious big second beat. But now I really turn my dreams into reality. I stayed down, it was coming eventually. Money where my mouth feels, my rhymes making a salary. But it's not really all it's cracked up to be A lot of shady business off in this industry I got in it for the love of the art Music flow through my veins, the drum beat of my heart Now, it's all about money, sex, and fashion Twitter and Instagram, how many people are passing Simple beats for whack books and wordplay that is lacking From a real standpoint, I'm really asking what happens We used to be a culture filled with passion The money came in and we look past it I walk away, God granted this grace Again he asked, would you rather be good or great? Hello, hello. We are here again on the Master Relationship Mechanic Show. And you all know this is my favorite Tuesday because I get my mister to get on this side of the camera with me. You know how he likes to be behind the scenes. But today we are here because we are talking about the widower's voice. We have an awesome guest who's talking about community, about the community that is built to work around and work through when you have lost somebody. So we are excited for Michelle Neff Hernandez to be speaking with us. She is going to share the story of her loss. She's going to talk about her organization and how it supports and helps the widow community. And not just the adults, but the youth in the community that suffer and lost from that as well. So you all know I like to jump in because we're always talking about having our best relationship with God, self, and others here on the Master Relationship Mechanics Show. So to set up our foundation, we're going to go to James 4 and 6. And I'm sure you all are probably familiar with that scripture. And you're like, well, how are you going to tie it into what we're talking about today? And this is about things to avoid. So when we lose something in life, this is where we need to go. James 4 and 6. It talks about, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So when something happens in our life that we don't necessarily agree with, we need to find a place of humility so we can go to God and not be so proud. We have to go him to him with our true feelings, our true heart, and be able to speak what it is that we truly need for him to do to us and not get caught up in this world where we can't have our best relationships because we've become so haughty and proud. And leading into that, I have a, a great song. It's called Broken Prayers. And the lyrics when it was talking about how we get these haughty prayers because we want to say all these eloquent words and we want to say these things. And God doesn't want it here because we get so scripturally based, but we are no world, we are no earthly good to anybody, and especially to ourselves when we're hurting. And this song that she's singing about broken prayers is how God really wants to hear our real voice. He wants us to cry. He wants us to break down. He wants us to talk about our feelings and our emotions, what we really need him to do for us, not just repeat scripture. And that is not what praying is about. It's just repeating the scripture. Yes, it's about calling God on his word. It's about interacting with his word. But it's about getting in touch with our feelings and being real to where God wants us to be. And that is how we truly heal on the grief journey, is telling God what he wants to hear so he can really do what we need in our lives. So you all join me as we listen and doing this little break. I don't want you all to leave me or lose me. This is the opportunity for you all to tag, share, and have other people join us. So at this moment, what you need to do is listen to Riley Clemens and the word is broken periods. And y'all know how I like to listen to the lyrical 
message, not just to the beat. It's a wonderful beat. She has a wonderful voice, but I want you to hear the words to understand if you're going through something, this is how God expects you to communicate with him to bring a change about your life. So in two minutes and two seconds, we'll be back. So go out and share and get some other people to join us online. Hello, hello, we are back. I'm glad you came back from the two minutes and two seconds. And as I said, those lyrics in that song is talking about how we say all of these prayers to God and we wonder why God doesn't hear us because we've gotten so high and mighty that we're not really speaking our feelings and our emotions, what God wants to hear. He wants us to be in tune with him and be in a place to be heard. And that is what I love, 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 love about Michelle Never her dad is, her group. Soaring Spirits, and we had an opportunity to participate in one of their functions called Camp Widow. It allows people to be who they need to be. It allows people, it doesn't push people, it doesn't force people. It allows people to use the voice of where they're at, at that moment, so they can work through their own individual grief and loss. It's nobody pushing it, it's nobody forcing them, and it's nobody telling them that there is only one way and a right way. Because everybody has to grieve in their particular way. So, Michelle, I am so glad that you um, gave us time this evening to join us. Because I know you are all over the place. And I know you just finished up a, um, a camp um, in San Diego. And I think that's where we were last year with you in San Diego. And we enjoyed that. Um, and we love the community that you, has, that you set up. But I, I really want people to know... What is your story and why did you set this organization up? 
Well, first, let me thank you for having me tonight. It's lovely to see you guys again. We enjoyed so much having both of you in Camp Widow in San Diego last year. Um, really, the reason Soaring Spirits began is because I was seeking community, because I wanted to be able to find a place where I could be understood and where I could talk about my grief in a very open way and not have to have all the answers, right? Not be able to... I didn't know where I was going. I just knew that I, my husband, um, Philip, and I had been married five years, and he went out for his evening bike ride. He went out on that bike ride every Wednesday night. He went with a group of friends. This this particular night, he had one friend with him, and uh, as he was riding along, he was hit from behind by a car and was uh, thrown from his bike. I got a phone call from his friend who was riding with him. He asked a person who was on the side of the road to call me. And I got there before the ambulance did and was able to be with him in his last moments. I was loaded onto an ambulance and went with him to the hospital uh, where he died about 15 minutes later. So he was 39 years old. I had just signed um, an agreement for his 40th birthday party because he never had a birthday party. I discovered he'd never in his whole life had a birthday party. And so I said, okay, for 40, we're definitely going to have a party. And um, I had, thankfully, I didn't try to surprise him. So he and I had been able to plan the party kind of together over the ensuing months. In fact, um, we shared a home office. My desk was against one wall and his was against the other. And I would write the guest list and leave it on my desk. And he would take it and erase my mom's name. <laughs> put it back on my desk so um he was just a jokester and really uh, enjoyed that he got the opportunity to work on planning his party he wanted a bounce house for his 40th birthday so that the adults could have time to bounce in the bounce house so anyways um he was strong and he was healthy and he was athletic and the last thing i would have expected was that he would be dead at 39 and so I was 35. We had a blended family of six. Three, he had three kids and I had three kids. And I didn't even know where to begin. I didn't know. I wished somebody could give me a checklist of things to do to be the right kind of widow. Um, <laughs> so I actually went looking. I, I thought, well, if I can't figure these questions out for myself, like, how long do you wear your wedding ring? Where do you put his shoes? What do you do with all the pictures? Do you put more up? Do you take them down? Um, I decided that the only thing I could think of was to ask other widowed people, but I didn't know any. And so I started asking my friends. I don't know if you know anybody who's widowed, but I have these questions I'd like to ask. I think someday I may make them into a book. And instead of a book, they became a community. I interviewed 30 other widowed people throughout the U.S. in the first year after I was widowed. And... Every time I sat down with someone who was also widowed, didn't matter how old they were, didn't matter what circumstances of their loss, didn't matter if we were the same age, none of that mattered. What mattered was that we shared this huge experience, this huge life experience, and we felt sort of able to, to complete each other's sentences. And that happened over and over again, 30 times that happened. And so at the end of that, I thought, what if all of these people could come together? And then I realized maybe it's bigger than that. Maybe it's the opportunity for any widowed person who's trying to put their lives back together after the death of someone they thought they were going to spend the rest of their life with. What if they could come together in community and be able to hear each other and witness for each other and be able to support each other as each one crafted their own way forward? And so from that experience really came the community at Soaring Spirits. And it was, it was an awesome community. I can um, attest to that. When we got there, I mean, you could feel the feeling of everybody was just so nice and they were so yeah. open. But at the same time, nobody was pushing anybody to be anything or pushing them into an uncomfortable space. It was just like, hey, we're glad you're here, but be yourself. You know, yeah. it's, it's if you go to a workshop, that's great. If you just go to the cry room, that's great. And I just <laughs> love that it was a cry room. 
Yeah. <laughs> but what really got me is there were men and women. It was a community yeah. because there's a lot of communities where we separate people mm-hmm. because we're in fear that we're trying to do the hookup with, you know, widow women. Yeah, widow for sure. Women. But yeah. I really think it, for men, it makes them more comfortable when women are around to come yeah. and show up and speak and be more in tune to their emotions. Mm-hmm. And that was a great experience. I know for my husband, he was like, oh, it's some other men here. That was yeah. you know, exciting. But I'm gonna I'm gonna let him ask you a question about you know the me. How did you come up with the me? Yes, yes. Um, explain to me how you come up because that can be a difficult task because mm-hmm. we are, we as men, if you don't open up, you do not open up. You try to hide everything. You try to just leave our frustrated out on something else. And um, I like to hear you talk about it because that's the problem that we have. As men, wives, and see, and I have a problem with it too, but I don't have a problem now. But when I first I met this lady, you know, <laughs> I spent half my time in the gym with that was my frustration. That's how I know I leave my frustration. I go out and work in the gym three or four hours a day, work all my frustration up. But when I leave the gym, that's when I have a problem. Mm-hmm. And that's what you have to do. You have to work on this, we have to work on this, and we have to be able to work on it all in from three different sides of it, spiritually, mentally, and, and physically. And mm-hmm. And for I did, I just know how to work on it physically. And then mm-hmm. I had no control how it's going to come out spiritually and mentally. So I need for you to, uh, to explain to you how you got the means involved. And, and another thing I want to add to it, too. Um, how do you, me and my wife had a talk with, my, with a close friend, uh, one of my relatives over the weekend. And how do you approach uh, everybody grief different? Okay, yeah. everybody have a different kind of relationship with their partner. Mm-hmm. So how you handle the situation? How you become? How you approach an individual that that they, they lost one too? But how do you approach them and make sure that they are comfortable with talking to you? Well, those are two really great questions. Um, the first question is to address the men and how we. How and why? So I was very fortunate early in my widowhood to meet a widower whose wife died in childbirth. Mm. We were both about the same age. And um, when we met, we connected in the same way I connected with every other widowed person I met, with this exception. He didn't have the same level of support I had because I had all my girlfriends and I had all the people, the women around me who I used to talk about anything with so talking about grief though they didn't have the same experience still felt like something I could do and he didn't have the same experience with his friends because they didn't often talk about those kind of emotional issues right they shared experiences they went out and did things together but they didn't necessarily have the emotional connection and he found that speaking with women who were widowed helped him because it opened up that emotional piece for him And after talking to him, I realized there's such a need for men to be able to find an emotional connection and a place where their emotions are not viewed as weakness, but their emotions are viewed Mm -hmm. as necessary for healing, right? As being able to understand and process them makes it possible for you to move into a life, your next life, whatever's next for you, you have to first process your grief and so after meeting Matt and connecting with him we're still very good friends today I realized that we need to make sure there's space for men in our organization and that we need to actively create a space for them where there's individual conversations with just men only where they understand that there is a space here and the more we've done that the more men have come and so they're consistently coming I believe very much in the con concept build it and they will come if you build a space for people and hold it for them and continue to offer it over and over again they will eventually come and so we've had more and more men attend uh, camp widow as a result and i think what it has offered them is twofold first it's a place for those emotions and an opportunity to begin to process them among other widowed people so the whole community at large and also one other widowed men And then it's also given them a space to talk to other widowed men about how they process their feelings, about whether it's physically or how they do it emotionally, how they do it spiritually. All of those things opens up when the conversation is just on the table, it makes it possible for people to talk. 
about things that in other circumstances they may not. And then to address the next piece of that, which is that we all grieve in our own way. I think one of the best things about Camp Widow specifically and the Soaring Spirits community at large is that there's so many people. Mm -hmm. And the reason I think that's important is because it helps you frame your experience. So if one person did one thing this far on the scale and someone else did it this far on the scale, you realize that wherever you are in between, that's, you know, kind of puts you in the normal, in the normal category. And to be able to meet lots of other people gives you a chance to be able to see that people process this in their own way. We all come to our grief experience wherever we already were in our life, right? We already were in a place, and then this grief experience happened. And in order to move forward, we have to process our feelings, but we also have to recognize who we are in that space and the ways in which we can grow through both our grief and our life as we start to craft whatever is next for us. That's very important to us. Um, um, in the that we had a conversation with, it was still locked down in a grief moment. Yeah. That can be a hint of it. That personal life that going on. Yeah. Uh, on in the future, man. That, and that caused, and to me, when, it, when that happened to an individual, and, and it kind of brought tears to my, my wife and my, mm -hmm. and my eyes, but that we were discussing it. Was in it. But it also, it, it was carrying that load, and it was, it was, it detected in me that she was being creating a physical problem. Mm -hmm. as health problems. Oh, yeah. Or you know, begin to have an eating habit and gaining mm -hmm. weight. And so that was very important how you deal with an individual like, because a lot of us, you were talking to an individual, but she had a lot of butts and a lot of this and a lot of that. Yeah. And I and I kind of kind of felt kind of sorry. I don't think you were getting to them, but I think we wouldn't get to them because it's, she grieved in a, in a way that she had a good relationship with her, with her, with her mother, and and <sighs> that was kind of hard. That was kind of hard because that's yeah. why I had a, it's it's kind of hard to uh, face them because they, they their relationship with that individual was very very close, very very close, mm -hmm. and we need to uh, try to ease the pain of because at a point that you have to stop your life, and your life must go on at all times. You must be strong. You must be strong for that injury that you that you grieving for because you got a life too, and, yeah. and it's hard to try to tell the injury that when you to that grieving point. So that's why I want to hear you talk about how you approach it because each person will be different. And well, I'll tell you that. Understand. The other thing about that is I think that there is a power in witnessing people's grief mm -hmm. and that sitting with them in it. Some people are just not capable. You know, it's hard to sit with somebody who's in that much pain and know that there's not something you can instantly do to fix it. And so I hope you know how beneficial it is that you were able to sit with her because being even able to sit with her lightens the load. So even when, you know, because right now she feels maybe that she's carrying it by herself. Mm -hmm. And for a minute, the three of you sitting together means you were carrying it together just for a minute, even if it's just a lightning in that moment. And then I think to be able to offer her the opportunity that if she can't hope for herself right now, that you're going to continue to hope for her. And I can't tell you how powerful those words can be for people who are not capable in this moment of hoping anything good for themselves in the future or hoping that at some point they're going to be carrying this in a different way. So if you're able just to say first witness, first sit, and just be without trying to fix. And then secondly, to be able to say, I hope for you. You don't have to do it for yourself. I'll take that for now. And we'll come back and we're going to check on this again and again and again. And I'm going to continue hoping for you until there's a day when I believe you'll be able to hope for yourself. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's really um, beautiful there. And I like what you said about that framework. You know, everybody's not going to be in that same place. Mm -hmm. and, and people look at people like, well, why has it taken that person so long? Yeah. It took this person so long. Yeah. It's, it's different dynamics. All of us mm -hmm. are different anyway. In an emotional place, you know, and things that, like you say, where we already were pre our grief. Yeah. You know, people don't consider that, you know, that mm -hmm. some people had a longer time to get adjusted. And like you say, mm -hmm. that wasn't something you were expecting. So it's different levels versus, you know, if you know something coming, something's coming versus it happens unexpected. All mm -hmm. of the different, you know, 
everybody has a different type of loss, as I say. So that means there's a different lesson and walk they have to do doing that journey, which is which that person has to do the journey. And yep. that's the key. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, when you sit there and you be like, oh man, I went through this. I wish I could just give you a magic wand. Just <laughs> spring, you know, like a little salt and pepper shake. Little sprinkle. Yeah, a little sprinkle. Yeah, sprinkle. And help people get past it. But yeah. the thing is, they'll never get that lesson unless they walk that journey. Yep. It was, it was something you said about men. You know, they kind of, they don't like to talk about sad stuff together. That make them cry. You know, when you're talking about that, that yeah. emotional piece, they'll talk about a lot of things until somebody has an emotional. And it's funny because that's how we actually got together is because his brother couldn't handle him talking about grief. <laughs> so we wanted to find a lady for him to talk to. <laughs> yeah. And I was actually his brother's coworker. And uh, he said, you know, you just lost your husband. My right. brother just lost his wife. I'm going to have him call you. And so he can start talking to you and stop That's talking right. to me. <laughs> so I can be done with this. <laughs> yes. So it, it's amazing. You know, they just, they don't understand actually how they do a disservice to each other, not being able to tune in to that emotional piece and just be able to sit and listen. You know, how we have that ability as women, we can be that nurturing and comforter, whether that experience has happened to us or not. We're yeah. able to just be there. Men, I think because they have that nature, they want to be able to give you an answer. Yeah, and a fix. And a fix. Yeah. And if they can't give you an answer and a fix, they want you to stop talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think also because of the processing, I also think men's feelings are super deep. And so because they are not as processed as easily as women seem to process feelings, ours rise more quickly and we sort of process them more quickly. I think because men bury their feelings more often than women typically, that those feelings run very, very deep. And when they start to access them, it's scary. I mean, I think it's scary for anyone to access deep emotion, but for men not having had the practice that women have typically to experience those feelings more quickly and more often, it can be a really scary and, you know, and they want to run from it. Like it doesn't sound like something anybody really wants to do dive into the deepest, darkest <laughs> pool. So, you know, they try to keep busy, like Fulton said with physical activity or, you know, with work, many men bury themselves as work right away so that they can stay as busy as possible, no downtime. And that's all really just a way of avoiding the depth of what lies within. And then another thing I like about your program too, your program is, is something like, like therapy in itself. I mean, therapy in itself, it keeps a lot of people off because me, I don't, me and my wife, you don't like us. And your program will keep people off medicine, if you know what I'm understanding. Because a lot of yeah. people going into depression, take depression pills and all this stuff. And that's what got me about your program too. That's what I love about it. Because we have to we have to we have to realize one thing. You know, medicine can't fix but the heart. <laughs> can't do that. Uh, and and uh, that's what I admire about your program. And so I love that you're teaching that to people and let them know that they still got self you know strength. I have, to, yeah. I have to rely on um, medicine to do that because, like me and my wife were talking, medicine is can fix one problem and also create another problem. Yeah, and what we hope to help people find is actually a toolbox of things that are going to help them because ultimately, even if they take medication for a short time, if they're helping themselves by processing their actual feelings, then they get to move through. I think when you get stuck is when you stop processing. And so whether medication sometimes helps you stop processing because it numbs your feelings or, but I know for some people, they need that break from the intensity in order to process. But we are really always about helping people understand the only way out is through. You can't get to the other side of this unless you actually feel your feelings and find a way to continue to process forward, right? Because the forward motion However slow, whether it's inch by inch or centimeter by centimeter, or whether you're going backwards for a bit and then forwards again, everybody's journey forward is different, but it's about being able to recognize, as you mentioned, that we do have a life, that we're still here, and that we have the opportunity to create something for ourselves that's valuable. It's going to be very different, but it can be just as wonderful. Yeah, people are afraid of what they have not planned. 
Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and that's the key. But I love that you got a widow community, not just women. You included men, but the component that you've actually included the kids. Now, how oh, yeah, did that evolve? That's how? new. Yeah, that's new for us. So we ended up, uh, um, because of the way our program is laid out, we will get certain dates from the hotel and they give us options. Well, one, three years ago, they gave us the date that included Father's Day. And I thought, we can't ask our widow people to come to camp and leave their kids behind on Father's Day weekend. And so we thought, well, what if we just do a one-time program where they come and they can bring the kids, the kids will have a program downstairs, the adults will have a program upstairs, and then at the end of each day, they'll come together and they'll, they'll stay together as a family in their hotel room, and then they'll go back to their programming the next day. So we tested it out thinking it was going to be a one-time thing and people loved it so much they begged us to keep going. So three years later, um, this last year, we just had our most, I would say our best and largest Camp Widow Kids event. So we had 60 kids downstairs and almost 30 volunteers. So we had almost 100 people on the lower level of the hotel and we had 350 people on the upstairs of the hotel. And so the adults were able to process in their way and the kids were able to process in their way. And then at the end of the day, they would come together. Um, and what the parents have said is that that has like, put them all in the grief space at the same time. So sometimes what happens is you go away and you do a program and you come back and your family hasn't experienced the same program. So they've not moved forward in the same way as you have. And they kind of look at you like, how did you get there? And so in this way, we're able to offer the kids and the parents an opportunity to process their grief at the same time, but separately. And so it can be age appropriate for the kids of, of all ages. Our program reaches kids from five to 18. And then um, we had many people who come back and volunteer for us who are over 18. So again, creating that peer community of people who have experienced the death of a parent and can reach out to younger kids. It's beautiful to watch the older ones and the younger ones. And then of course, when the parents come back together, for them to have the opportunity to process as a family. Because their family unit has been altered in a significant way and that changes all their lives. And so if we can kind of help them get on the same path forward instead of kind of diverse paths forward, then it can be useful for the whole family. Um, and it's been such a gift to be able to do it. Um, question. I want you to explain how, how is it in, that how very important it is to have your kids involved in your grief. It's yeah. highly very important because it's it, it, it's make the kids harder than they do their their parents because the kids may be closer to their mom or to their dad and they take it harder. So it's very important. Not it's, it's important for their their their, their will to the gun too. But explain to us how important it is, how definitely important it is for you bring the kid because that's that's a very important part of this. So I'll say in this in two ways. First of all, one of the ways that we serve widowed parents, I remember when my husband died, the first thing I thought was, you know, like my kids are going to be ruined. Like that becomes a fear, an active fear for widowed parents is that their kids are not going to recover from this and they aren't going to be able to emotionally adjust to this horrible thing that's happened that you can't fix, right? There's no Band-Aid. There's no way mom can make this better. And so I remember so clearly how that felt. And part of what we do for widowed people is help provide them with tools to help them care for their kids. And so we do that both in the adult program. We did that before we even had a kids program talking about ways in which you can help. Because here's the thing, when an adult uh, spouse or partner dies, you have the ability to see forward into the future in a way that children do not. And so you experience the loss all at once, all together. You can imagine all the things they're not going to be here for. You can imagine all the way out to grandchildren, even if you have a baby, right? So your baby's dad just died. You can imagine they're never going to hold their grandchild. So as an adult, you have the ability to hold all that in your head. But as a child, they can only experience it bit by bit by bit. And so as they get older, for for a parent, you have to process with your kids all the way through until they have the same understanding as an adult. And so that's a long, long, tiring, hard process for everyone. And I think what happens for the kids is that if they have the opportunity to speak openly about their parent, 
to be able to express their love and their memories. If the name of their person is spoken regularly in their home, it normalizes for them their feelings. It normalizes for them the attachment they still have to the parent who died and begins to be able to help the whole family heal. So what we love about being able to serve both parents and kids at the same time is that we hope that they all have the similar experience in being able to remember, to honor, to love the person they're all missing at the same time and be able to say it at the same time, right? Because sometimes one kid may be feeling sad one day, the other kid's feeling great. The mom or the dad is not aware. And so, you know, this one little person who's missing their person, their dad or their mom might not say it out loud. And so if all of us can get on the same page at the same time and be able to express how we're feeling, it gives you an opportunity to sort of reset as a family and be able to make it clear that the loving and the honoring and the remembering, those are all normal and they're part of grieving and they're part of loving and living. Um, I, I, this is um, another one I want to ask this. I be in your, we are in your, in, we are in your meeting, okay? All right. You got a father and a son, or you got a mother and a son. And we, 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 the mother lost the husband, or the husband lost the wife. And you got the kid there with the mother, you got the kid there with the father. And your program that you got them is working good. Why is that in your system? Now, my question I want to ask you is, how do you let this proceed on to the the individual house. That's yeah. what I want to hear. That's a great question. One of the ways we do that is by creating community, not just for the parents, but also for the kids. So many kids uh, programs only allow the children to come one time because there's so many kids to be served that they can't continue to welcome children to come back time after time. Our program allows them to come back, which allows them to create community. So um, we've heard that many of the kids stay in touch with each other. They talk, then they have a community of other people who normalize their experience. They have friends who have dead moms or dead dads. And then the tools that we're providing for the parents are to help them create a space where there is remembering and honoring and living with the death of someone you love. They also then have a community of their own so that they can talk about parenting challenges. They can talk about just living life as a widowed person challenges. So that ongoing sense of community is such an important element to be able to say, I've got people who support me who are also trying the same thing. So if they're having trouble with their teenagers, they can go to the our, any one of our groups and say, ah, my teenager's doing this. And somebody else could say, oh my gosh, my teenagers did that too. Or, you know, have you thought about this? Or have you tried that? So they have the opportunity to stay in touch. We really work hard for this not to be a one-time weekend. It's not just a weekend and you're done. It's a weekend which introduces you to a community, which a community will be ongoing really for the rest of your life. I have widowed friends who have been part of my life since the beginning, and now they're just my friends. And I know that we're going to be together through the rest of our lives. And what we have that's unique is that really intense tie where you've shared the deepest, darkest, hardest feelings. And so when you get to share the joy, that's just an added benefit and it cements your relationship as you go forward. And you know, the best that I heard you, that I like what you just got through saying, it's a continual work progress. Yeah. You say we don't be in an eight week program or see people on nine year on your eyes, but on your own, because you get a lot of rejection like that because a lot of people don't develop faster like other people develop. So mm -hmm. that's the part that I got from this is continual, continual, continual communication, continue, yeah. and continue to feed. That's, that's power. That's, that's good. Yeah. And another component of your, um, that you get to invite a guest. I thought that, that was wonderful. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't just, it wasn't isolated. Like everybody here has got to be sad or depressed, you know, and it was so that the other family, you know, I saw people invite their sisters mm -hmm. so they could understand what was going on. And then I even met someone who invited their per the person that they were dating so they could mm -hmm. understand, you know, some of the components that were going on. So they could sit and ask questions about, okay, so is this normal? You know, yeah. when you're dating somebody who's lost a spouse, you know, mm -hmm. because they, they hadn't lost the bait. So they needed to normalize, you know, how do I date a widow? 
And, yeah. and that was important for them. So I love that the different communication that was going on and the diversity that was available, not just the community for widow people, but mm -hmm. a community that, you know, invited family, invited, yeah. you know, that next level. So you didn't have to say, okay, well, when I start dating or when I get remarried, this community is going to kick me out. Exactly. You know? So you're yeah. afraid of going to the next level because, okay, I like these people, so yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't want to change. Well, and they become, they become your people. And yeah. so you can't imagine living your life without them. And so one of my widows was in a support group and they had journeyed together for like three years. So then when she got engaged, um, the leader of the group told her that she was sorry, but she was going to have to leave mm -hmm. because she was engaged. And so she was in a different place than all these others. And that meant no more community for her. And that just breaks my heart because yeah. for widowed people, you're not healed, stamped all better once you get into a new relationship. In fact, many times that complicates your widowhood because it brings up your fear of having to experience widowhood again because it makes you wonder whether you know comparing one spouse to the other is normal but when it makes you think why am i acting so crazy yeah. because you you know and who else would you talk about that with except for widowed people who have been in a similar place and so we always say there's no graduation from camp widow you don't graduate from being widowed you don't suddenly become all better and never need any more support and this community is available to access at any point in your widowhood wherever you are because you know that's what a real community is about you don't graduate from community yeah, you don't get kicked out. Because right. so, so, you, you make people afraid to develop and grow because if I grow, right. I'm going to lose. I'm going to lose all my people. people. Yeah, what's <laughs> making me feel good. Yeah. And, and then, like you say, when you get into a relationship, I think a lot of people, that, that was for us, you know, we got in a relationship and we got married. So they were like, okay, y'all good. Right. We don't need, yeah. I don't all know, better. Uh, y'all good now. But we're not realizing we both had our own past, our own, not just past, but grief baggage that we were still, yeah. you know, intertwining in our regular, just the regular mm -hmm. nuances of a relationship. Right. So I, I do, I love all of what you have in place. Yes. Um, yes. I definitely want you to tell people how to connect with you. When is the next um, camp? How do they become a part of this community? Even if they haven't been, been widowed, how do awesome. they support Great. this community? Because there's many people out there who have relatives that they want to support yeah. and they just really don't know the resources that are available or how to just sit and listen because we just cry and we want to fix it because we're right. with you. Yeah, for sure. So any person can connect with us through any of our social media channels. Soaring Spirits International is where we are on Facebook, at Soaring Spirits on uh, Twitter, and at Soaring Spirits INT, which is for international, on Instagram. We do some really cool social media programs. We do a day for newly widowed people. We do self-care Sunday. Uh, we do inspirations. We do also um, focus week. House, Soaring Spirits houses the largest collection of blogs written by widowed people in the world. And so we highlight a different portion of our blog every single week. So following us on social media will give you an opportunity to connect in those various areas. Then our website, soaringspirits.org, will give you options to check out all the ways that we support widowed people through all our various programs. Campwidow.org is specific to the Camp Widow event. You can find that from the Soaring Spirits website, but Campwidow.org. Camp Widow is such a big event, it needs its own website. <laughs> so um, we have all of the different locations. So we're located in Tampa, Florida, San Diego, California, and Toronto in Canada. Uh, Toronto is our next camp, actually. We'll be there from November 2nd to the 4th this year. And all the information about that camp is located on Campwidow.org. Um, the kids camp is once a year. It's in San Diego. So we just finished that. We'll be doing that again next year in uh, July, July 12th to the 14th of 2019. Again, all that information can be found on the Storing Spirits website. Are you deep to remember all these things? <laughs> <laughs> I might have been planning lately. <laughs> But, I mean, we are glad that we got invited and got to see that community because it, it really set a different um, mindset for us as well. It's seeing the mixture of kids, women, men, and it, and it was great. And for anybody that's on the line that's listening, 
whether you know, if you know somebody that has lost a spouse and you feel like, okay, they are not healing, they're not growing, they're not moving, they're stuck. If you, and I say throw them into this community, <laughs> you, you register them, you buy them a ticket and you show up as their guest and, and walk with them through this community, it will help them. Even if they don't do anything but go to the cry room while mm. they're there, they'll get to experience a, a relief and a weight that they'll get to um, get off of them. And, and I believe that that's really what um, that song is about. You know, broken prayers is because we have when we go to God, we don't have to act whole all the time. Like we got it all together. And if we can be broken. If we can actually just pour out all our emotions and everything that we have, God will really help us get to that next level. And that's, we have to realize God works through people. Yes. And that community yeah. that you set up allows people to put themselves in a place of vulnerability mm -hmm. so that they can receive the help to gradually move. They don't have to move yeah. at supersonic speed like some people. They can move at the speed that is aligned for them. Mm -hmm. And that is the beauty of it. So I encourage people. That is, that's a wonderful gift to give other widowed people. You know, you are, you're always trying to figure out what can you do for them. Yeah. That, I believe, to open up a community for someone, to find other people to connect to, especially young people. Mm -hmm. Especially young people. They need to be able to find things. So, like, when a daddy-daughter dance come up and they don't have yeah. a daddy, they can call their friend who doesn't have a daddy and say, yeah. hey, let, let, what, what happens on this date? What are we supposed mm -hmm. to do so they don't, you know, evolve into angry people, yeah. you know? So, I just, I applaud you for it because I know that it's, it's a lot of work that goes into these conferences and especially for them to be three and I mean, I already know you're going to have more than three so soon. I know <laughs> you're going to be adding another place besides Canada. So because women all over the world are experiencing grief and it's somebody else who's out there. Because I know it was people from all over the world for the, for the one that we were there. You know, people were from Australia, people were from Canada. Mm -hmm. and, so, Mexico, yeah. yeah, Mexico. So it was it's a wonderful experience. And I love you have them during different times of the year. So nobody's forced to come during summer, yeah. like their only summer break or, you know, right. so they have the capability and flexibility to come at other times. So we are glad you came yeah. and joined us and I hope it really helps somebody heal and they can find those tools and resources that you have developed and are there. Well, it's been such a pleasure. And first of all, good to see your faces again. <laughs> and also, uh, you know, just to share that, and I'll, I'll end with this, which is that, you know, many times we think that vulnerability is only about ourselves. Mm -hmm. But the truth is that when we offer ourselves in a vulnerable state, we also have the opportunity to help other people heal. And I think that's one of the most powerful things about Camp Widow is that we bring a bunch of broken people together and together they start putting the pieces back one at a time, next to each other and for each other and with each other. And that is something really beautiful to witness. Yes, the yes. witnessing is beautiful. So I got to be obedient to time. All right. It, it triggers along. So um, we we'll look forward to seeing you again. And like yes, for sure. Your face is great. So thank you for joining us. <laughs> well, thank you so much, both of you. So good to see you. Good to see you.